Good morning, everyone, and uh, well, thank you, George, and the organizers for organizing this wonderful event. Um, so my topic line, it looks quite complicated, but in effect, I would like you to read it as uh, 4D var with LES. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So it's variational assimilation. So given the three methods, sequential, variational, and the recent hybrid approaches, I'll be focusing mainly on the variational approaches and focusing more on the 4D var side of things. So this is a, a graph that was presented by Dr. Dominic Heitz at the keynote lecture for the CFD for PIV2. And it maps basically the recent publication in the fields of experimental fluid dynamics, which is on the left, and computational fluid dynamics on the right. And we have data simulation in the middle. And in red, we have uh, publications that are focused on uh, uh, flows in 3D. And in black, we have ones which are focused on flows in 2D. And as you can see, in both the individual methods, there are a lot of studies which I mean, almost all of them are basically focused on 3D cases. But when we come into the data simulation scenario, they're quite limited, and it's mostly 2D. And we had some recent publications by Meldi and Poo in 2017, for example, which have focused on 3D assimilations. And the reason for this is, I think, quite clear. The first and I think foremost limitation is the computational cost. So for in the 4D bar or variational assimilation challenge, it's quite intense and 10 times the CFT cost is actually, I feel quite low here and it's much higher usually. And also we have the need to get accurate volumetric data sets. We need a good estimate of the initial condition or it leads to more iterations, et cetera. So in order to address these, so we have a few challenges. So the first challenge is the need to reduce cost. And for this, the classical attempt is to go towards turbulence modeling. So you go from, instead of a DNS, you move towards an LES or a RANS model, for example. In our case, we wanted to do unsteady simulations and we wanted to actually characterize the turbulence. So we're going to work with LES-like simulation. The second challenge is the need for 3D observations. And in this case, I'll be presenting a reconstruction technique that we developed, which is capable of providing volumetric data sets from 2D cross-plane data. And finally, when you have a turbulence model, it, you're in the unique position of actually um, optimizing this turbulence model. So by introducing this as a control parameter in the variational data simulation, which I will also touch today. So I'm not going to go into detail into the turbulence modeling. So the model that we chose to use here is uh, the is a stochastic model called the modeling under location uncertainty, which was proposed by Mema in his 2014 paper. So in this, the velocity u, which is the total velocity, is decomposed into two parts. We have here the w, which is a large scale deterministic velocity, and we have here the sigma dBT, which is a stochastic noise or a random noise. Now, this is a stochastic model and using stochastic calculus, he derives the entire conservation equations, uh, etc. But if we assume that this small scale noise, which is sigma dBT, is unknown or subgrid, so to say, we end up with a set of equations which are very LES-like. So I'm going to show you here the momentum conservation equation that we have, which is derived from the decomposition I just showed you. And this is quite similar to the classical LES-like framework. So we have the time derivative. We have, of course, the pressure, the molecular viscosity. And we have an additional term here, which can be seen as very similar to the LES eddy viscosity term. This is also a dissipation term. And what's more interesting here is maybe the, the term in blue, which is a modification of the large-scale advection. Now, I'm not going to go into details of this advection here, but if anybody is interested, I refer you to this publication here, which is focused on this term and what it does. So this LES model, we actually applied it uh, for the flow that we are interested in, which you can find in this paper here. And we found that it actually works quite well for the flow, which is a wake flow around a circular cylinder. And we find that it was better than the classical models for the specific flow. And this is actually goes back to the, the information given by uh, Dennis that the business viscosity assumption is actually restrictive. And in this case, with this specific model, we are not limited by that assumption. So I'm not going to go into further details about the model. I'm actually going to go on to the second set, which is the reconstruction technique that we developed in order to get volumetric data set. Why do we need to do that? Is because data simulation requires 3D volumetric data. And while PIV and Tomo PIV are upcoming, they are still quite restrictive in terms of domain size as well as cost. So a cheap reconstruction technique can be quite useful in this case. 
And with that in mind, we developed this so-called snapshot optimization method. Now, this method is not applicable to all flows, but it is applicable to all the set of flows which have a certain homogeneity axis. For example, if we take here the wake flow around a circular cylinder, along the spanwise direction, we have a certain homogeneity. Now, the idea of the method is quite simple. So if we have two cross planes of data, so we have here in red the inlet plane, we have here in blue what we call the observation plane, and these two planes intersect at the blue line. Now, because of the homogeneity, which is there in the spanwise direction, so along this direction in the red plane, we have we have these additional planes of data which we don't have, which are depicted by these black planes here. However, if we are able to obtain time resolved a large set of samples on this green plane, because of the homogeneity, this large set of snapshots that we do have should have within it a representation of the planes of information that we are missing for the time T0 here. So this is basically becomes an optimization problem of identifying the right snapshot of the green plane, which would fit best with the time snapshot that we have here for these black planes. So this, with this, we can develop a simple method. So here I've shown you as a, in a pictorial way, an example. So if we have here at time T0, which is at the initial condition, uh, a plane which has three uh, observation planes of which we only know say the first one in blue but on this blue plane we have a set of snapshots from t1 up to tn which is quite a large set of snapshots say 10,000 or so on within this set of snapshots we can identify the snapshots that would fit well into our volumetric domain to give us a volumetric data so for that you develop a simple uh, cost function and you can optimize this using a simple gradient descent method so we have here the cost function which is optimizing the error between our observation plane which is the blue line here and the brown lines on which we have data for the planes that we don't know but we do want to fill and when we optimize this method and we do the gradient descent you can actually identify the snapshots and when you slot them in you actually get a volumetric reconstruction and which is quite accurate in the sense that you get a turbulent field which is not a mean reconstruction but actually has unsteady data sets and i would refer you to this publication here if you want to have a look at the results that we get i'm again not going to go into it too much an added advantage of this snapshot optimization method is the ability to estimate the background covariance matrix uh, I say here estimate because it's not a true representation, but imagine if you have on the observation plane a large number of snapshots, say 10,000 or, or however many. So instead of using all of them to create one reconstruction, we can instead use a first X number of snapshots to create one reconstruction and the second X to create a second reconstruction and so on to obtain an N set of reconstructions for a given time T. Now, once you have these N set of reconstructions, you can then do a simple SVD. So you take, you remove the mean from these set of reconstructions that you have and you do an SVD. And from this SVD, you can actually estimate your background covariance matrix, which I have shown here. So it's basically just the left singular vectors times the eigenvalues, which is S and the right singular vectors. And from here, you can estimate the inverse of the background covariance matrix, which you will need to use for the data assimilation procedure. So this actually, as I said, is an estimation. And when we actually input this covariance matrix into our data assimilation procedure, we obtain quite a significant cost reduction. So it turns out that by introducing the covariance matrix, while we did not necessarily improve on the results in terms of the error, but we did definitely significantly reduce the cost. So I'm finally coming to my 4 var LES formulation. So this is a classical formulation. The main difference that I would like to note here is the, the error due to the model, which is usually on the outside, on the right-hand side, and is generally assumed to be zero. But in this case, since our dynamical model is an LES model, which is not a DNS, and therefore not entirely accurate, we have introduced this into the model, and we have said that our LES model is basically the error here. So it produces the error. And this can be optimized by optimizing our LES model. So we have here 
the background condition, which is X naught of B associated to a, to a background error. We have the observations Y associated to an observation error epsilon. So we use the classical, so we get the classical cost function, which is an optimization of the background error as well as the observation error. And this leads to the classical gradient, which is obtained using the adjoint method. So we have here the, the gradient function. And now the additional thing that we want to look at here is the control parameter. So we can introduce additional control parameters. For example, say if we are looking at the inlet condition, if you want to optimize the inlet condition, or in our specific case, because we have an LES model, we can introduce the LES model as a control parameter, and we can derive an additional cost function which has some extra terms, which corresponds to the optimization of the control parameter to a predefined value. And the corresponding gradient with respect to the control parameter is also derived where we have an adjoint model which takes into account the control parameter. So here is a classical flowchart of, of how we do our 4D variational assimilation. So we have the background condition. And if we so if we choose to go for an incremental optimization method, then we have to do the tangent followed by the adjoint to get an optimal delta x naught. And this is, of course, uh, optimized using the classical LBFGS method to obtain the final delta x naught, with which we then update our background, our initial condition. And the outer loop is run until we get convergence or to a certain limit, depending on the computational resources available. And from there, the optimized x naught, we can then get our assimilation trajectory. So for our case, in order to obtain the tangent and the adjoint, we use the automatic differentiation tool called Tapenad, and we get the tangent and the adjoint codes. So the now I'm going to present you the results that we have. I'm not going to go, we did quite a bunch of studies actually, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'm going to present to you just one result basically, and which is for the wake flow around a circular cylinder at Reynolds 3900. And so what we have here is the depiction of the fluid flow. So we have the inlet on the left and we have a circular cylinder and the box in black is the box on which we do assimilation. So we do not account for the geometry within our assimilation domain. And the optimization is basically done on the initial condition. And as control, we have the inlet condition as well as the constant which is used, which is used to optimize our code LES model. So here I have some parameters about the domain. So the full domain, uh, the observation domain, which is here, and the 4D bar, which is done on the same domain as well. So to give you a rough timeline of the simulation, so we have at time T0, the reference simulation is run up to time 90, where we take our data set for creating to be input into our assimilation procedure. So this from 90, we have the delta T obs, which is the duration of our assimilation window here, we can see so which is just 100 time steps and the observations are input every delta T obs, which is every 10 time steps. In addition, the simulation of the original window is run further up to time 690 and this is required in order to produce snapshots for using with our snapshot optimization method. So I'm going to go to our first set of results, which are the only set of results I'm going to show here. So on the left, we have here the true reference, which is obtained from our full scale simulation. Now, the assimilation that we have done here is actually quite interesting because this reference data that we have is actually not fully provided to our 4D VAR algorithm. What is instead provided is basically just two cross planes of data. So if I go back here, so we, we have the inlet plane of data and we have one plane which is situated in the middle of the spanwise domain. And the reconstructed, the snapshot optimization reconstruction method is used to reconstruct our background as well as our observations. So we are providing to our assimilation algorithm data sets that we have reconstructed, but which are not the true data because we are assuming that the true data is actually not known. So with that, I show you here the reconstructed observation. And since we do not know the true observations, there is a certain penalty imposed via the observation covariance matrix. So we only have high confidence on the inlet plane as well as the middle plane on the spanwise domain, while the rest is assumed to be low confidence. 
And we have also the background condition, which is provided simply using our optimization reconstruction method as well. And on the right hand side, this, as you can see, is our analysis, so which is basically the result of our algorithm. And if you see, it's basically a, a give and take between the background condition that we have provided and the reconstructed observations that we have provided. And the thought that goes here is it does not really match well with our reference per se. But given that this reference was not actually provided at all to the to the algorithm, and if we further look at the error, which is provided, we actually see that there is an improvement. So if I explain this graphs here, so we have the root mean square error for the U, V, and the W velocity on the Y axis. And on the X axis, we have the time steps of our assimilation window, which goes from zero to 100. And in the X are the reconstructed observations, which are provided to the 4D VAR assimilation algorithm. In blue, we have the background condition, which is reconstructed at time T0 and then run forward using the CFD solver. And finally, we have the optimized analysis case, which is in red. And as you can see, it's it has improved on the background condition significantly in all cases, and it matches well with our observations for the U and V. However, in the W direction, it actually improves on both the observations as well as the background. Now, this happens mainly because the snapshot optimization method because it is slotting of different snapshots, it does not ensure continuity in the in the spanwise direction. So it destroys continuity. However, when this is introduced into our CFD solver, which is rigid and has to ensure continuity, it significantly improves on the spanwise velocity by ensuring continuity and improving on the velocity field as well. So further, as I said, we have introduced the LES model coefficient uh, as a control parameter. And we have here on the left, the initial value, which was uh, fixed for the entire domain. And the algorithm was allowed to optimize this value over the domain. And this was what we obtained from the algorithm. And if we look at the vorticity of the reference, you can see that there is a certain match between the regions of high turbulence and the regions of high coefficient value. Of course, the larger the turbulence, more the dissipation will be required, and hence there's a quite a good fit between the coefficient, uh, which is predicted with the vorticity and the turbulence in the field. And when we do introduce this coefficient optimization as compared to a as an assimilation without the coefficient value, so here you can see in red the assimilation which is done without coefficient optimization, and in pink or magenta the assimilation where we do optimize the coefficient, we actually do get an improvement. Now, there are a lot of parameters involved, and this could be further tuned by, for example, introducing a temporarily varying coefficient. For this specific study, the coefficient is assumed to be constant a long time and only varying in space. So if we do have temporarily varying coefficient, I think we can further improve on this as well. And finally, I would just like to talk about one thing. So. Generally, the, the cost of 4D VAR or 4D variational assimilation limits the time step as well as the stability because of the adjoint method. You cannot have long or large time windows of assimilation. However, the concept of sliding windows is quite useful wherein you do assimilation over a short time window and then you slide the window and you go further ahead in time. And by doing this, we actually did this for the cylinder case for one vortex shedding. And here I've plotted the statistics that we get from the assimilation window, as well as the classic background condition that we had. And as you can see, there is quite a good fit for the mean, mean flow, especially for the U velocity. And in the V velocity, we see there are certain mismatch between the, the reference, which is in black, and the, the assimilation, which I would like to point out is the field in pink here again. And this is because by using just one vortex shedding, we do not have still sufficiently resolved methods. We do not have enough time steps to actually resolve it. And hence, if we go for further sliding windows and we incorporate, say, over two or three vortex sheddings, this should improve significantly. And finally, I'll show you the same thing for the fluctuation statistics, which is uh, the U dash U dash profiles here and the V dash V dash here. And as you can see, when we have the data simulation, which is in magenta here, the curve is actually quite converged as compared to all the others. If we look at the red or the blue curves, which are the classical without assimilation. And 
while there is while it is converged there is a certain dearth in the turbulence so as in the, the statistics are under predicted for all the turbulence measures that we have here and this is because the snapshot optimization method that we have used here is an average is in an average sense unless the turbulent fluctuations are actually smoothed out and this is what is provided to the assimilation algorithm and thus we see that effect here where we see that it does not predict the turbulent measures so well, but it is capable of converging the fluid, the statistics quite well. And with that, I'll just go to my conclusions. I hope I've not exceeded my time. And this is basically restating what I've just said. We have shown that 4D variational assimilation of high is maybe a misnomer here. Moderate Reynolds number flows are feasible when you introduce turbulence modeling while ensuring that you have turbulent fluctuations and an unsteady case. The snapshot optimization method facilitates to do 4 var when you have limited data, for example, just cross planes of data. Coefficient estimation is shown to improve the turbulence model prediction. I think this is something which is very interesting for me as a turbulence modeler. And finally, sliding windows does help in if you want converged statistics and you want to do long term variational assimilation, sliding windows are an expensive but plausible solution. Thank you.